te te koto te faro o Auckland Unitarians te te koto na manuhiri no mai higher mai higher mai ki te ne fare karakia a te atoa te te koto te te tato katoa. We welcome you into this circle of community. Welcome it to this space made sacred by Auckland Unitarians for 116 years. On this Labor Day weekend, we welcome you from demands and delights of the daily round, from the dirty dishes and unwaxed floors and unmowed grass and untrimmed bushes, from all incompleteness and not yet startedness, from the unholy and the unresolved. We invite you to attend to our vision of peace and justice, of cleanliness and health, of delight and devotion, of the lovely and the holy, of who we are and what we can do. We welcome you. We welcome the power of tradition and the exhilaration of newness the wisdom of the ages, and the knowing of the very young. We welcome beauty, eloquence, poetry, and music to be the bearers of our dreams. We welcome you to open your eyes, your ears, your minds, your hearts to the amplest dimensions of life. And we especially welcome you if you are a visitor or just passing through or seeking a spiritual home. Know that we're pleased and honored by your presence. You should also know that our worship service is the prelude to morning tea. It is our sacrament of hospitality. Please join us. It won't be complete without you. Now let us move into worship, willing to be authentic with each other, honest within ourselves, and open to connection in all its forms. This being Labor Day weekend, uh, it's become kind of the opening to summer, to barbecues and all that. But there was a time when there were big parades and uh, everybody would go down to Queen Street and watch the floats and the, and the banners and the people marching by. It kind of died out when corporations started sponsoring the floats. <laughs> but how did we choose the fourth, the, the weekend uh, closest to the fourth Monday in October? Anybody know? It was, yes. It was the celebration of the eight-hour day. That's why we don't celebrate it here when they do in the U.S., because they got the eight-hour day in September. <laughs> and here that Labor Day is Father's Day, so that doesn't work. So uh, when Rachel and I first got together, we used to spend time comparing our two worlds. And we found that they had a lot in common. For instance, they were both shrinking. And, uh, you know, people going to church were less. Unions had been fighting the good fight, but laws had suppressed their membership. Uh, but what the more positive thing that we shared is both traditions love to sing about their history and their hopes and their future. And so I thought I'd play you uh, a modern issue of a song about the eight-hour day, uh, so you would remember that th that hard-fought battle uh, lo long ago in the 19th century uh, is still an issue today. Come all you workers and hear what I say, they're trying to plunder the eight-hour day, won by our forebears in a bloody campaign. So rise up and be in the struggle again. 
So stand up united, let no one be try. Our right and our children's the eight hour day. Individual contracts were made for the fool. If business divides us, then business can rule. If we let the government back what they say, it's a 12-hour shift and no penalty pay. So stand up united, let no one betray. Our right and our children's the eight-hour day. This system they're making's a ticket to hell. Working weekends and Christmas and New Year as well. No time for the needs of our children and wives. If we let productivity measure our lives. So stand up united, let no one betray. Our right and our children's the eight-hour day. It's a user-pay system, as I have heard tell. They're using us hard, so they better pay well. Business and government walk hand in fist, and it's only in union that we can resist. So stand up united, let no one betray. Our right and our children's the eight-hour day. So come, all you workers, and fight this abuse. Let overtime hours be our right to choose. Fight to regain a fair penalty pay and grip like a bulldog the eight-hour day. So stand up united, let no one betray our right and our children's the eight-hour day. We light this chalice with full hearts. We affirm our relationship with one another. We recognize our agency and our connective power. And we accept our responsibility to be bold and courageous. We light this chalice, symbol of all that we are, all that we have done together, and all that we will be as our shared ministry encourages those within and beyond our walls. Okay. All right. So, Peace and Social Justice Report for September. Firstly from um, Shireen, who's involved with Amnesty International. What does Amnesty do? We investigate and expose the facts whenever and wherever abuses happen. We lobby governments and other powerful groups such as companies, making sure they keep their promises and respect international law. Each month we write letters in response to rapid action requests from Am Amnesty International. The October letter is written for the Nicaraguan student leaders and others who have been arrested and detained for exercising their rights to peaceful protest about their Nicaraguan authorities' increasingly repressive strategies including promoting a shoot-to-kill strategy and a repression of social protest in Nicaragua. One of the students arrested is a young medical student and a cousin of a New Zealand citizen. And if anyone's interested in um, helping with letter writing, please see Corrine. The Books and Schools Project. Gary, Paul, Angela and Brenda were happy to attend the Duffy Role Models Assembly at Glen Taylor School last month. Thanks to the PSJ group and the church's congregation, our church is able to provide 50% of the cost of new books distributed to the pupils at Glen Taylor School on an ongoing basis. The books given are ones that the children choose and take home to keep. Quite a moving thought, isn't it? Helping kids build up a library in their own home. The students were a delight and the staff welcoming. We look forward to building a closer relationship with the school's management and students with possible assistance in other areas. We hope to be able to bring some ideas for participation to the congregation early next year. The Dyslexia Project. Paul reports that the Tongan Dyslexia Project ran well this year and has now finished as students are busy after school studying for their end of year exams. The tutors from the Library Trust we work with are looking forward to next year. 
In Samoa, the Ministry of Education, Sports and Culture have restarted the Dyslexia Project on a small scale and have asked about the idea of developing a Samoan version of the STEPS Dyslexia Programme. With Stanley's urging, Paul has written an article about the two projects for the Ponsonby News, which hopefully will be published in the November edition. And um, just a reminder that we're having a fair, a fair here on December the 8th. The theme will be um, ethical gifts, and the profits of that will go to peace and social justice projects. So um, please support us at this fair and bring your friends. Most of you know that my partner Rachel is very active in the union movement. But for those who are visiting, Rachel is the Vice President of the Council of Trade Unions. She's the Director of Organizing for New Zealand's largest private sector union. And uh, as a result, and because I wanted a Sunday off for preaching, <laughs> I've invited her to speak this morning. Et fare tu akene tenakwe, et fano o Auckland Unitarians tenakoto, enga manuhiri tenakoto haere mai, norera tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto kato. I mostly avoided history at school. I was too much reading. I like reading modern poetry, shortish novels, aphorisms. Brevity is the soul of wit. History had great heavy tomes. So when Clay asked me to speak on Labour Weekend, I thought, Labour Day, hmm. Samuel Parnell, um, what exactly? I do think it's important to consider how the past has got us to here, but I'm often hazy on the details. So thank goodness for the New Zealand Dictionary of Biography and Google, and before Google, thank goodness for the index. The indexer is the most noble of professions, I have to say. So I invite you to join me this morning on a journey out of the haze. The first thread of the union movement in this country was laid down when English carpenter Samuel Parnell landed at Pitone on the 8th of February, 1840. One of his fellow passengers asked Samuel to build him a house. This is Samuel's famously quoted reply. I will do my best but I must make this condition, Mr. Hunter, that on the job the hours shall only be eight for the day. There are 24 hours per day given us. Eight of these should be for work, eight for sleep, and the remaining eight for recreation and in which for men to do what little things they want for themselves. I am ready to start tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, but it must be on these terms or none at all. His terms were accepted and so he began to work. He also out-organised the other employers who were trying elsewhere to impose the British standard 12 or 14 hour day. Samuel met incoming ships and talked to all the people about the eight hour day. In October, hence Labour Weekend, there was a meeting of tradesmen where they all committed to an eight hour day and resolved to duck anyone in the harbour who offended against the resolution. It was a loving kind of an event, I imagine. So this is a story of courage and of reducing inequality and of reducing the hardship known to working people. And it's left us a hero to commemorate. So why had Samuel Parnell settled for working 12 to 14 hours a day in London but wouldn't do it here? Maybe because of the marketing of the colony as a better England? Maybe, but that didn't cause the employers to think up the eight-hour day. It was because he had the leverage. Carpenters were in short supply and employers had little choice but to comply with the conditions. That and unity with all the carpenters coming off the ships being organised and holding the line. By 1890, the eight-hour working day had become standard for tradesmen and labourers, but many other labour employees still work much longer hours. The Labour Day parades that we've heard about before that began that October were part of a union campaign to force the government to restrict working hours by law rather than simply by custom. Government didn't do that 
uh, but they did establish the public holiday that we now celebrate on the fourth Monday in October, Labor Day. Um, so the labour movement had grown a lot since 1840 and more threads were being woven into our union history. The Sweating Commission report of that year, 1890, officially concluded that there was no sweating in New Zealand. However, it seems that was largely down to definitions. The report contained a minority opinion that referred to a definition of sweating from Beatrice Potter, not Beatrix, I checked it as a different person, um, who had spent time in the sweatshops of London, and she defined sweating it as consisting in one, overcrowded or insanitary workshops or living rooms, two, long and irregular hours, three, constantly falling prices and low wages. The opinion goes on to say, if this be the understood definition of sweating, then there is abundant evidence of its existence in the colony. There are numerous overcrowded and insanitary workrooms, great numbers of workers labour long and irregular hours, and, many, and wages in many trades are at the lowest possible ebb. Harriet Morrison enters the story at this point. Uh, she would later be chair of the management committee here at the Auckland Unitarian Church. She was, in 1890, leader of the Tayloresses Union in Dunedin, a union that was established in the wake of the sweating revelations. Her union raised wages and established industry standards throughout Otago for Tayloresses. Harriet also organised and ensured the survival of the Tayloresses Union in Auckland and maintained contact with Tayloresses throughout the country as she believed unity was vital to the Tayloresses cause. Harriet Morrison was also a, a suffragist. She appears in a um, bar relief in Christchurch standing next to Kate Shepherd. Um, she was a Christian and a community activist. She believed that the issues were interrelated, that improved wages were linked to women's suffrage and to the recognition of skilled labour, and that all these were in keeping with her faith. And so the fabric becomes more intricate as the analysis broadens and more threads are woven in. All throughout, unity is vital to the cause. Values also underpin the work of unions. The value of unity, the value of equality, the value of non-material things such as time to allow people to be part of a community and express their humanity. The union movement uses its leverage in support of these values. And when there is conflict, it is the conflict that arises from setting the value of humanity against the value of profit, the value of unity against the value of domination of some over others, the value of equality against the value of a small group enjoying superior status and wealth. And so a carpenter has eight hours a day to express his humanity, and a tailoress has enough material comfort, the dignity of having her skills recognised, and enough time to be part of her community. You may have noticed that Samuel Parnell's and Harriet Morrison's issues, working hours, too many or too few, pay and recognition of skills, are very much issues of today too. Why are we still grappling with these things? The International Monetary Fund, that hotbed of socialist revolution, <laughs> reported in 2016 an association between low levels of union, unionisation and high inequality. Unions internationally have diminished normally, uh, enormously since the worldwide neoliberal takeover of the 1980s. This is a direct factor in why the issues of the 1840s and 1890s are still issues today. Yet unions remain the largest democratic institutions in the world. 300,000 people affiliate to the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions through their unions and the International Trade Union Confederation has 207 million members worldwide. And we are still, we continue to be a fabric of many threads. So what's happening now? Um, so we're in a world that is beset by the threats associated with climate change. About 20 years ago in the US, a group of unionists, First Nations people and environmentalists started a movement for just transition. Environmentalists have been calling for an end to dirty jobs, particularly coal, oil and gas, and the people making profit from these jobs had stood by while the people working the jobs railed against the environmentalists who wanted to take their jobs 
and destroy their communities. And a project that combined the new threads of decolonisation and environmental protection with the threads already in the union movement, the project was about a transition away from dirty jobs, but also about the need for justice in that transition. In any change and with any new industry, there are three important questions. Who pays? Who benefits? And who decides? In the union I work for, Etu, we have members who work in mining on the west coast of the South Island and members who work in oil and gas in Taranaki. I have met some of the miners and they've said to me, don't you tell me I have to be a bloody basket weaver. They don't actually say bloody. Um, When they hear about a transition, they hear that their jobs will go, their communities will be destroyed, and that they will no longer have an identity. The identity of miners runs really deep. And basket weaving, unlike mining, is not well paid. And those miners live in communities where the teachers, shopkeepers, public servants, mechanics also rely on the economic activity of mining. And in my union, we also have many Pacifica members, particularly in Auckland. A couple of weeks ago was Tuvalu Language Week, and a Tuvaluan colleague was talking about the effects of climate change on her community. In Tuvalu, the highest point is 3.5 metres above sea level, and the people in Tuvalu can no longer drink the groundwater because of rising sea levels. So what's a just transition for a miner, for a Tuvaluan, or for their communities? What must they pay? What will they benefit, and who will decide? It is usual for governments and the heads of corporations to decide. It is common for the most vulnerable, the colonised, and the environment to pay. It is normal for the already wealthy and privileged to benefit. A couple of weeks ago, during Tuvalu Language Week, by coincidence, the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions held a one-day round table on just transition. Attendees included tangata whenua, corporate heads from the mining and electricity sectors, government ministers of energy, climate change and workplace relations, and unionists from New Zealand, Australia, and from the International Trade Union Confederation's Just Transition Unit in Oslo, and also environmentalists. The event was guided by a whakatauki, or Māori proverb, that goes, ki te kāhore, he whakakitanga, ka ngaro te iwi. Without vision and foresight, the people will be lost. The question of who decides is very much driven by whose vision and foresight get to be the basis of whatever we do next. The roundtable was the beginning of a conversation with everybody's voice in it. The union movement is calling for a seat at the table right from the point at which the vision is established. The miners' need for identity and community can then be part of the vision. The Tuvaluan community's need for land and drinkable water too. And the union movement's ambition for a more equal world can be part of the planning. We can plan for jobs with enough but not too many hours, with skill recognition and with decent pay. And Tangata Whenua as the kaitiaki of this land and as a colonised people can be part of weaving decolonisation into our future. The vision for what kind of community we want can be a shared vision. Then we can work out what kind of work it will take to create that community. And then we can work out what kind of skills we will need to do that work. When the government and the corporations who can invest are part of the conversation, they can invest in the necessary retraining, the necessary infrastructure, and in the new economy. Then, with vision and foresight, and with listening and planning and action, the people will not be lost. Kia ora. Just a little communication. Um, So the next thing is meditation, and I ask you to get comfortable and um, consider um, what you've just heard, but also consider one of the lines out of the song that we'll sing after that, which is, hearts starve as as, as well as bodies, and think about what your vision for the future might be.
my closing words are very loud. My closing words are by Jonah Lou Johnstone. We shall overcome when we can truly celebrate the diversity of contributions of talents offered by all people. We shall overcome hatred and prejudice and oppression when we can truly extend our hands to one another in loving acceptance. We shall overcome the past that haunts us now. Living in peace and freedom, we shall overcome the wrongs that have happened and the debts left unpaid. Let us join together in that commitment to overcome.